sensation. In this video, we're going to get an introduction to some of the terms and concepts in our chapter on sensation and perception. We're going to go through some of the vocabulary and some examples, but we're going to leave most of the discussion for in class. So what is the difference between sensation and perception? Sensation are smells, sights, sounds, taste, touch, balance, pain. They are the raw data of experience that in and themselves are meaningless. But when we sort, identify, and arrange by mental process, they become perception. Let's look at these two different diagrams. Let's look at this one first. We have all these different inputs coming into the brain, the brain and then being sorted and farmed out to different parts of the brain for interpretation. This picture, a little more um, colorful, again shows the same process, information coming in from all different sources, from out in the body, from our different sensory systems, coming in, sorted, shuffled, sent to different parts of the brain to be comprehended. So our first big concept is that sensations happen at sensory organs and perception happens in the brain. Now when it comes to processing information, we can think of this in two different ways. When we think about bottom-up processing, we're talking about information from sensory receptors coming in and going up to higher levels of processing. Contrast that with top-down processing, where our interpretation is based on constructing perceptions drawn on both sensations coming into the brain and our experience and expectations. I think this is better understood graphically. We have all different ideas coming, or, or components coming in, like the color, size, shape, texture, and those bits of information are coming in. But at the same time, we have prior experience, we have emotional uh, state, and we have expectation coming down. And where they meet in the middle is perception. What this should make really clear is that perception doesn't always equal reality. In class, we'll talk more, uh, give more examples of the difference between top-down and bottom-up, or top-down and bottom-up processing. We'll give some examples, and we'll use our our uh, reading from the man who mistook his wife for hat uh, to give us some concrete examples. So let's talk about sensation. Sensation. The, for our first vocabulary term is the term transduction. When sensory information comes to the body, it's physical energy, waves of and particles of light, pressure on our skin vibrations that we feel uh, on our skin or through our ears with sound, taste. Um, these are physical energies that come into the body and that physical energy has to be converted into neural impulses, into action potentials in our sensory structures. So this diagram represents the back of the eye, the retina, and we have all these receptor cells that have to be uh, stimulated by physical energy, light, and convert that or transduce that energy into neural impulses. So some energy must stimulate receptor cells, and we have lots of different receptor cells for vision, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. And those receptor cells have to be triggered, initiating action potentials, and those action potentials rush to the brain and are then put together to form our reality or our perception. Now the brain's constantly receiving billions of signals. How does it distinguish between different forms of stimuli? In other words, how does it know which active potential means sound versus which active potentials and neural impulses mean light? All active potentials look the same. They're just neural impulses. If you were could zoom in and be the size uh, of the cell and were standing standing on the side of the road above this neuron watching uh, active potentials go by, they would all look the same. Remember, there are no strong active potentials and then weak active potentials. Right? There's no fast ones or slow ones. There are just action potentials. So zooming by you would be action potential after action potential. You wouldn't know whether the action potential meant sensory input from light or touch or smell or taste or sound. So how does the brain understand this difference? The answer lies in the route that that information takes to the brain. For example, information from your eyes travels through a very specific pathway and ends up in the primary visual cortex and is interpreted as light and color it's never interpreted as sound, whereas information through your auditory cortex comes in through your ears and is routed to the part of the brain that's interpreted as sound. If we take it a different way, if I could somehow reroute this visual information, let me use a different color pen here, if I could reroute this visual information and instead of taking it to the visual cortex, take it to the auditory cortex, what would we see? We would see sound. We would hear light. 
If we rewired the brain where the information coming in from the ear, instead of, went, instead of going to the auditory cortex, went to the back of the brain to the visual cortex, we would hear uh, or see sound. It's not that these neural impulses look any different. They all look the same. It depends upon which track of the brain they come into in terms of how they're interpreted. Two more examples. If you close your eyes and press on your eyes, that pressing on the eye will stimulate the back of the neurons in the back of the eye just like light hitting them will. Then you see color, you see light. Try it. And if you get hit hard in the ear, you'll have ringing in your ears. There is you stimulate the inner ear, you hear sound. What about strengths or intensity of stimuli? Again, we can't send strong active potentials versus weak active potentials. So how do we understand the difference between a soft noise and a loud noise, between a tickle or a slap, or between reds and oranges? Well, the answer comes in not in the size of the active potential, but how frequently the active potential may be traveling and how many neurons are sending the information. So now we need to move on to some other vocabulary terms and concepts. The first one is absolute threshold. What's the lowest amount of stimulus you can detect? Well, we have a term for this. It's called the absolute threshold. And it's defined as the smallest amount of stimulus a person can detect 50% of the time. And what's interesting is, and you could do a hearing test and they put, uh, they can lower and lower the tone, um, beeping and uh, wearing headphones. And at the point where you're getting it right half the time, that would be your absolute threshold. But the interesting thing is that uh, our absolute threshold tends to seems to change. And it's, it de it's very dependent on the surrounding environmental conditions. Under ideal conditions, uh, our absolute threshold is quite low. Uh, you could see a, uh, a candle lit over a very great distance um, at nighttime uh, as compared to the day. Uh, here would be a little example. It's very easy to see this, this uh, flame, but if I move it to a different background, it makes it more difficult to perceive. Same thing with sounds. If you're on a busy street corner, your ability to hear soft sounds is much less than if you're in the middle of the desert in the middle of the night with no other sounds around. You'll start to hear all kinds of things that you couldn't have heard on a busy street. Our threshold changes to fit the conditions. So our first term is absolute threshold. Our next term is called the signal detection theory. And this relates because we said that our ability to detect stimulus is dependent. Well, it's not only dependent on the other environmental conditions, but it's also dependent on our psychological state. This is a theory that predicts when we will detect weak signals. For example, parents who are, have a newborn baby are often very tired. They're getting very little sleep. And they might sleep right through their alarm clock. But you know what they won't sleep through? They won't sleep through the sound of their baby crying, even if it's in another room and very low uh, in terms of audible, not being very audible. And think about when you're home alone at night just after seeing a spooky movie on TV and every little noise in the house you seem to hear, whereas before you would have ignored those noises. Our psychological state can kind of uh, make our sensory system more, uh, more sensitive, and that's called the signal detection theory. We'll give some more examples of class about how expectation affects our ability to recognize stimulus. Another concept that our book talks about in this chapter is subliminal stimulus. By definition, subliminal stimulus is that stimulus that's below our absolute threshold, therefore outside of our conscious awareness. And the question is, can it influence us? And there's lots of controversy around this idea um, in determining, in, in trying to answer this question. There is research done that under very specific laboratory settings, it seems like these subliminal messages, ones that we don't know that we've seen or heard, can affect our decision making. There's very famous cases of these subliminal messages being implanted into movies and songs. For example, in a movie theater, they put in, like in one single frame, this message, hungry, eat popcorn, uh, so flashed up there so that no one would notice it was there. It was there and gone before you'd notice, and they said that it would increase popcorn sales. It's found that in the real world situations, this has uh, no real effect. The next term we have to be aware of is called the difference threshold. What's interesting about our senses is that what we notice most is change. Um, not stimulus to st stimulus, sorry, a change like no stimulus to having stimulus or low volume to high volume. The smallest amount of stimulus change that we can detect 50% of the time is called our difference threshold or the just noticeable difference. 
What's interesting about this concept is it doesn't work on a one-to-one -one ratio. In other words, if you were carrying 100 pounds and I added one pound to it, you probably would notice a difference. But if you were carrying one pound and I added a pound to it, you would probably recognize it because we've increased the amount by 100%, where over here we only increased the amount by 1%. This ability to recognize differences uh, in, in stimulus is called, is called the just noticeable difference, or the minimum amount is the just noticeable difference. So the question is, what is the smallest amount we would notice? And the answer is, is a very specific ratio, and it's based on a concept called Weber's Law. It's a ratio between the new stimulus and the original stimulus. So the bigger the original stimulus, the bigger the new difference would have to be for us to recognize it. And the smaller the original stimulus, I mean, the smaller uh, change we would be able to recognize. So on one pound, we might notice, you know, adding one ounce. But to, to feel the difference when we're carrying 100 pounds, it might be, you know, increase of five pounds before we'd even notice it. Our next concept is sensory adaptation. The diminishing sensitivity to an unchanging stimulus. This is a process by which the sensitivity of our, our senses uh, protects us. It allows us to filter out meaningless stimulus and focus on what is changing. A couple of examples. When you walk into a room and you notice a strong smell, but after a while you stop noticing it. Or when you first put on your clothes, you feel your clothes touching your skin. But as you go throughout the day, you don't notice that that stimulus is still there. It's not that your clothes are not, no longer touching your skin. It's just that you're not responding to that stimulus. There's an evolutionary value in this sensory adaptation. If a stimulus occurs, we'll recognize it. And we'll, all right, our, our nervous system will respond to it. If the same stimulus happens again and again and again, numerous repetitions over time, the response to that stimulus will become less and less and less. Think of it like this. If it hasn't hurt us or helped us yet, it's probably not important, so we stop paying attention to it. But if something in our environment changes, if there's a new sensation, a new sound, a new smell, a new touch, we're, our sensitivity to that will remain high. It's the novelty that's important. In your book, there's a picture that looks like this. Uh, and it talks about the, the idea of what would happen if you were looking at the same thing over and over and over again without change. Would it stop? Would we stop responding? It, like we stop feeling our clothes, would we stop seeing it? The hard part is our eyes very seldom stay still, and so we're not seeing the exact same image all the time. So they made this little camera that tracked the eye and was projecting an image on the back of the eye. And if it moved with the eye, then you would be seeing the same thing over and over again. And um, the images did start to disappear as the eye stopped responding to an unchanging stimulus. So what does this little introduction tell us? Hopefully it gives us an example showing us that sensation and perception are not the same thing. We're going to watch a video in class that makes this very evident, but I'll give you one more uh, concrete example. What if you have your hands in uh, one hand a bucket of hot water and in one hand a bucket of ice water, and in between there was a bucket of room temperature water? When you move your boat, your hand from the cold water to the room temperature water, that water will feel warm. When you move your hand from the warm water to that room temperature bucket, that water will feel warm. But what if you put both hands in at the same time, one directly out of the ice water bucket, one directly out of the very warm water bucket, into that bucket of room temperature water? How would you perceive it? Is sensation, our sensation and perception different? Well, that concludes our introduction to sensation. Well, next part of this video on sensation will be specific about a couple of our, our, our sensory systems, specifically vision and hearing, but we'll also touch on some of the other senses. We're going to reserve class time for discussions uh, of some of the issues around these uh, terms that we've just learned.